Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're back live again. We're not traveling now for a while. I think we had enough. We got home right before Christmas, and that was enough. Stay home for a while. Tonight is January the 17th in the year 2014. (laughs) I'm still in the old year. 2014. And uh, I don't know where the year went, but here we are in a new year. Okay, and uh, we've got a guest tonight, and she's one of our new authors, and we're going to be talking about her new book. Right. But if this tonight's going to be about UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> You're there, aren't you, Sherry? I am. I'm here. Yes. Okay, but if, if anyone wants to call in, I'm going to give out the toll-free number. And let's try to stick to the subject. Yeah, we'll keep keep with Sherry's information. Yeah, instead of going off on the little mm-hmm. rabbit trails. Right. Okay, the toll-free number is 1-888-627-6008. 1-888-627-6008. Okay, and Sherry, I saw in your email that you just got back from Sedona. I was in Sedona um, last week, and from there went down to Tucson, and now I'm in Austin, Texas, but spent uh, about five days in Sedona. Just loved it. I was wondering, yeah. what did you think of it? Oh, I've been there before, uh, and I I really, really am drawn to it. I wouldn't mind making that my permanent home. <laughs> oh. yeah. Yeah, we have been there many times, but the energy there is uh, a lot of people can't handle that energy. And they don't want to stay in it all the time. Mm, no, I I enjoyed it. I find the energy in Tucson to be almost even even more so. And um, somebody once said that was because they they store all the those crystals for the gem show um, are stored around Tucson. But I know it's a different kind of energy in Tucson than in Sedona. But I I just loved Sedona. I feel yeah. very much at home there. Yeah. I do too. <laughs> yeah. You know, Sedona was the Indian sacred place, and the white man was never supposed to even be there at all. Is that right? Yeah, they were never supposed to live there because no one lived there. It was just the Indians went and had their ceremonies, oh. and it was sacred because they knew the energy. Right. Wasn't there a tribe that lived there that suddenly just disappeared? Suddenly they were gone? Um, I haven't heard that because I heard that no one lived there. They just went there for special things. Maybe that's why nobody lived there. Maybe it was long ago. Well, the I, energy yeah. is mm-hmm. is strong. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that they I, didn't. Didn't the, didn't the tribe go um, go into the next dimension? Is what the theory? I but maybe I've got the wrong place. I don't know. Well, in one of my books, I talk about a tribe that did that, but hmm. I don't remember where they said they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Uh-huh. This was trying to connect um, the dots on it. I have a caller, but can you more uh, introduce Sherry before we go to the caller? Okay. If the caller, just stay on the line for a minute. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sherry Wild is our, our guest tonight, and she's one of our new authors, and she's written a book called The Forgotten Promise, and it's about her lifelong experience with UFOs. And uh, she's going to tell how she worked her way through it. Because, Sherry, you said in the beginning you had all of the fears and everything that everybody goes through. Oh, yes, yes. But then Um, you finally worked your way to where now you realize it's not nothing to be afraid of. Right, right. When you first, you know, it. It's it's like peeling away layers of an onion, the the experience, because the, the early years of my life I had encounters and I didn't really know what was going on. You would have partial memories, but the blocking was so good, uh, they really blocked me quite well. So And most of my encounters were daytime. Um, so they did everything they could to keep it from being fearful, but I still um, had strange memories, couldn't connect the dots on what was happening to me. And then as I got older, um, I had friends who were witness to some of my encounters and still the odd things. You just, you, I never thought it was alien abductions, which I don't like to call it that, but um, and uh-huh. until the late 1980s when um, there was so much activity 
and um, it was just time for me to awaken. I really believed that my life was programmed and planned. So in the late 1980s, I I came into awareness of what was happening with me, and uh, my initial reaction was one of just fear, total, total, total complete fear. <laughs> I was scared out of my mind. It's a human reaction because we yeah. are human. Yes, and, and and I still to this day, I mean, my encounters continue to this day, and I notice that my body still gets fearful if I know that they're there and going to be there. Um, if I don't have time to get myself settled into a clear state, um, a clear state of presence and get feel that connection to my source, I can still respond with fear to them. So uh-huh. it's a strange thing. It, it, we're multi-layered you know, we have different bodies. You know, you have your mental body, your emotional body, and, and all the different bodies. And I think it's my probably my mental body and my physical body that respond with fear. Yeah. Yes, that's to this day. Yeah. yeah, that's the human part. The human part is even yeah. though we realize it, I have a lot of people say, oh, I want to meet them. I won't be afraid. Uh-huh. But they don't realize that that human part of us yeah. that you have no control over. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. exactly. Where it goes back to the animal part, as Julia just said. But, um, no, a lot of uh, what you were, t- that's why I wanted to publish the book, because it goes along so well with all the things that I've discovered, because it does start out with fear, and there's too mm-hmm. many people out there uh, talking about the negative part, not realizing it's only the way they view it. Right, right. As soon as I overcame the fear, I mean, I spent a long time believing that I was the ultimate victim. Um, I just, I, I was absolutely certain that there, that there was hardly, um, anything worse than this because I couldn't hide from them. I couldn't keep my children safe from them. Um, it was just an ongoing thing. And sometimes, um, they were two, three, four times a week, um, Mm. coming into my life. And and it, it was so disruptive to my life. And I really felt like a victim. But I just, there was a part of me that didn't accept that, that just, there was a part of me that kept saying, but where's God in all this? And Mm -hmm. how can this, you know, how can this be that I can be a victim? Something about this, and there was just a part of me that, you know, we're multidimensional beings, and so there was a part of me all along that had an understanding of what this was about, and I I just kept looking for the answers, and it was, like I say, my life was programmed. It was planned this way. I was meant to come into the awareness of the truth of the, of what this was all about, and, and I came to the understanding that I had volunteered, that I came here for this purpose, right at the same time, that, and I got validation of that. As soon as I came into that remembering, then I came across your video, Dolores, on, on oh. the Internet. <laughs> Yeah, and it validated it. It was like saying, "Yep, that's exactly right." Because I was like, "Well, that can't be." I'm <laughs> I making that, that up, a you lot. know. Yeah, but you know, you were talking about uh, you don't like the term abductions. They no. don't like it either. No, but no. you know, I've been doing the investigating for over 25 years. They prefer to call it visitations. Oh, okay. I call it. I call it encounters. Yeah, yeah encounters. encounters is a good word too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You, we ought to take the caller now. Is she? The one is still on the line. Yeah, we can see what. We'll see what that about. is. I just wanted to give a background first. Uh, are you still there, caller? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Who um, is? What, what's your name? Okay, uh, hi. My name is Sabina, and I'm calling from Northern Virginia. And I wanted to call in and thank you, Dolores and Shuia, for the work that you do in um, bringing these subjects to the public and helping us all understand why we are changing and how we are changing and all of that. But uh, since you're talking about UFOs today, I had a question. Um, Do any of you know if the comet Eisen is is a comet, if it's still out there, and if there are really um, spaceships attached to it or flying alongside of it? Do you have any information about that? I'd like to hear what Sherry might know, because we really haven't had much information on that. But I will tell you, though, this has been, for years, they've been talking about comets. And when the comets come, there's supposed to be spaceships in them. It's something that's repeated constantly, and it's never had any verification at all. Right. We haven't gotten anything, so that's why oh. I don't know. Sherry, do you, have you heard anything, or do you know anything on that? I, I, I don't. Uh, I think that um, the little bit that I know about it, 
and I agree, there's been all this, there's been a lot of fear mongering about comets and all kinds of things yeah. and uh, stories about them. Um, what resonated the strongest with me in regard to the information on this one was what Patricia Cota Robles had said about um, that uh, she put out a, a posting on it. And I, I'm not going to try to, to restate it here because it, I don't want to, I'm not sure I would get the facts correct, but she, it has, she said that it was programmed to come along at this time, that it was created along the same time that the that our solar system or universe was created. I'm not sure which or if it matters, but that this was programmed to come through at this time to bring back with it the energy to help us with the awakening process. And um, I think a large portion of it has gone, was drawn into the sun, and, um, and all that's continuing on is our small fragments of it now. And... Um, this is my understanding, and it is based on what Patricia Cotto Robles has said. And I trust in her information a lot. I think that she has contact with some pretty um, high vibrational entities. She calls it the, um, what is she, I can't even think of what she calls it now, um, uh, lesions of light or something like that. And so I think her information is probably as accurate as, as anyone. Well, yeah, it's a good I, response. I'm, it, it is, mm -hmm. but you know, the first time I heard this years ago, they were talking about this comet coming around, and there was supposed to be space grip mm -hmm. in the tail mm -hmm. of it, and I said, I don't think any <laughs> ET with any sense is going to ride a spaceship in the tail of a comet, because it would be pretty bumpy, I right. think. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it's funny, the thing, the stories, um, you know, because that's not how it works. I mean, I think you have a clear understanding <laughs> of it, the ETs. You know, they're well, interdimensional, and, and they don't, it doesn't work like that, you know? I know. Exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah they, don't, they, don't, they don't need to do that. <laughs> but that's what they try to make the fear. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. 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 I, I know, but, but uh, everything I heard was, was really positive about it, and I heard that they're doing it in order to get more people's attention that are ready to, you know, to, to deal with this, that they uh -huh. are out there, there's life out there and that um, the chances of um, NASA and the government covering it up would be lower if we could all see it up there in the sky, and um, um, that they would be doing positive things for um, the planet. I even read something about crystals being uh, deposited on the planet to help us raise the energy or the vibration. And I, I heard good things about it. I just haven't seen it in the sky and it, it seems there are no pictures of it. So I was just wondering, since you guys have um, a connection to different sources, if you had heard anything. Because, you know, in my work, I've never, ever, in all 26 years, found a negative experience. Wow. It's well, all in the viewpoint. Right. I know. This mm -hmm. is why I believe it. Where we live in Arkansas, too, we live on top of a huge um, crystal deposit here. So the crystals are having a big uh, effect right now. There maybe is there something to do with my, all that. My thought, as you were saying that, um, Vina, is um, those things are going to happen anyway. They don't. I think somewhere it's got merged with this comet, and I don't think that that boy. And that's coming from yeah. My oh, okay. Um, that something's gotten mixed up here. You have the comet event. And then you have the ETs, whatever, they're going to start being more visible. They're depositing crystals. They're doing things to help the Earth. They're doing things. They're two separate right. things. I'm, my whole oh, okay. my fiber is saying these two have gotten mingled, and that's not necessarily the case. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Oh, and Julia, I'm going to buy your book, Soul Speak. I can't wait. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and uh, thanks for calling in. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. But, but, Sherry, see, that's the thing I've been up against since I first started the investigations way back in the 1980s. Was every, even, all the investigators had the idea it was negative, right. and people were being harmed, and they didn't believe what I was finding, and they didn't mm -hmm. like it because it was disputing what they were finding. Yeah. That's why I like your book so much, is it goes along exactly with what I've been uncovering. You know, that's interesting, Dolores, because what I'm finding, I'm being invited to speak at different uh, venues and that, but um, the hardcore 
um, groups that are really into the UFO investigation aspects, um, what I call the nuts and bolts of the UFO. Yeah. We know who you're talking about. I know. Yeah. We know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 don't, they, don't, they don't necessarily want to hear what I have to say because it doesn't have fear in it. It doesn't have... I know. I've, yeah, because I've moved past the fear, and they call it airy-fairy. And they don't want to yeah. hear that airy fairy they've stuff. Called, because, they've, yeah. they've been calling me that for thirty years. That yeah. I said, I've heard they just tried to discredit everything I've done. Yeah, I think that it's the human condition. You know, when you look at humanity's story here on the planet, um, they fell so far into fear, and and now they're coming back, and they're they're being uh, ushered back into the light. And yeah. I think that it's just the humanity's way of being that they they have to have they project that fear out, and if it doesn't have fear um, around it, it can't possibly be real. They can't even they can't even imagine something being positive. So it's a strange I had thing. one man at one conference we were at. He um, we I don't even know how we got into this. We happened to be in the vendor area, and he came up to me and he was talking to me about how um, you know did we choose. Like, if you're having encounters, did you choose that? And I said, yeah, it's all chosen. It's a contract. You know, I didn't sign any contract, and he got really upset. And if that's the case, why are, why is everybody so afraid? If there's, if they signed a contract, they wouldn't be afraid, you know, if they didn't agree to, you know. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was explaining to him, it's, yeah, it, it's, fear is a natural thing, but, oh, that was his reason. That, they must be doing something bad for you yeah. to be so afraid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know it. I've had people argue with me, too, and walk out of my talk. Because mm-hmm. they stand up and, and they want to they want to argue with me about it, and, and they insist that I've been um, the Stockholm syndrome and I've been brainwashed, uh-huh. and all, uh-huh. yeah, all brain kinds force. of other things. Yeah, and 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 um, you know, if they read my book, they'll see that you know I I, I certainly struggled against ever against all of this. You know, I mean, I I went to several psychiatrists. I wanted to be found insane. You know, that was easier for me to, to deal with that than to believe that I was being abducted by aliens. I mean, I went through the whole gamut. Um, but I'm a fairly, I'm a very rational person. It's just in my in my nature to be that way. So I yeah. can I can understand people being that way to a certain level, but at some point you have to open your mind just a little bit more and, and start to allow some light, <laughs> allow some light in a little bit, you know. So it's been interesting. Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of these and other investigators at the UFO conferences, they say, I'm not finding the truth because I'm not finding the evil and the horror. And uh-huh. I said, that's because it does not exist. Right. But right. They, they can't, you know, they have their own viewpoint, and I respect that. I respect mm-hmm. their research, but mm-hmm. I've been doing it long enough. I think if there was anything there, I would have found it by now. Well, well I think I, it's a matter of opening your, your vision, your your view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Opening it up to a broader perspective. Do you think that if there's um, some of the negatives might be what are called the milads, the the military abductions, um, that might be perpetrated to kind of keep the fear going? Um, well, there might be some of that. Going well, on. in the UFO community, we have what we call disinformation and right. misinformation right. that the government is deliberately putting out there. Right. To make them appear uh, to be the bad guys. Right, because so far right. you haven't come across any of these military abductions. No, I haven't. But we have definitely come across people dispelling misinformation. Yeah, right. we know a lot of them that do that. Right. And a lot of times, you know, I've done it long enough, I know if it doesn't sound right, to me that's the government is planting a story. Right, exactly. And they're clever. Right. It's done very cleverly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I know it. And I know that even my own experiences, um, some of them can seem on the surface to be very cold. Um, and people have asked me, they say, well, you talk about the bruises. And you talk, you know, they left bruises on you. And, and they drop you off in the wrong place in the middle of the night in the freezing <laughs> cold. And I say, yeah, they do that. But, you know, everything was programmed and planned. And I believe that some of that was about... Um, I believe those are like leaving little um, breadcrumbs or markers along the way so that when the time came for me to awaken, because I don't think they left any anything um, to chance. Everything was programmed right to the smallest detail. And I believe that those were like little markers so that I would remember those encounters. And 
you know, not, no harm came to me ever. I mean, you know, so finger bruises on my arms and injection sites and all the other things. Plus, a lot of it had to do with keeping my body healthy. So, um, you know, it's all, it was all there was always a, a reason for behind what happened. On, on the surface, it's it's a lot like like the the um, the analogy that's always used is the child going to the doctor and the doctor having to give a shot to the child. It hurts. And yeah. the child doesn't understand, and that's a lot like what we have. And through your fear, you filter it through your fear, and your perception is tainted by that by that layer of fear that you have. So, yeah, see, this is what I'm, I've written about in many of my books too. That the they what they're doing is checking just to make sure we're healthy. Right. That right. we're they're keeping you healthy, and that's all it is. And sometimes mm-hmm. they use machines that make marks, mm-hmm. and they said the marks go away, so they haven't done any mm-hmm. harm. Right. Well, we're, you know, at the conference, oh, by the way, we are having our UFO conference. It's the 27th year, and it's in Eureka Springs in April. And uh, Sherry's going to be a speaker there. We're also having Travis Walton is going to be a speaker there. Oh, good. Okay. And, you know, in his story, you know, the book Fire in the Sky, and we just talked to him a few months ago. We were out in L.A., and he was dropped off in the wrong place, but oh, okay. said he knew it was done on purpose. Right, right. And he thinks he was picked up by accident. He wasn't <laughs> supposed to be picked up. Oh, I know. I have heard him say that. That's interesting, isn't it? I didn't, didn't, yeah. think, I didn't think those guys made mistakes like that. No. <laughs> I don't know. Well, he be, said, yeah. that would undermine my uh, my understanding of the universe if they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. He wasn't supposed to be there. He walked out into this beam, and he thinks right. that he thinks they took him on board to to help him because he was right. really, he was hurt. Right, he being in that energy yeah. beam from the ship, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And so he thinks they helped him, and then they put him back outside of town where he'd be safe, and he could get help, and he could get back into town. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Uh, to me, all of this is rational whenever you look at it without the fear involved. Right, which is hard to do because it's. I say it's like an like an ant trying to trying to describe um, an elephant. You know, uh-huh. uh, you know how can an ant describe an elephant? And uh, you, they have such a limited perspective of it. And that's kind of what we're doing, on, uh, trying to to make sense of something in such a limited, dense vibration. And we mm-hmm. have such a small view of it. So I have limited limited perspective, but also limited concepts. Right. Lim- Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So all we have is what we have, and and we're trying mm-hmm. to. Yeah, that's excellent analogy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was I curious, um, Sherry. You made a comment earlier that a lot of your encounters are in the in the daytime. Right. That's not heard of that often. I know. It's right, isn't right. it? Right. So what? Yeah. How would it happen, or what do you remember about that? And and do you? I wonder why why it was happening that way. I believe that, um, and I don't. I believe that a lot of the encounters were during the day because it's less frightening that way. Um, I think there is twofold. I think it was because it was less frightening for me, and also because I've had so many encounters that it's almost like impossible to do, to do them all at night. Um, you know, I mean, they've been. I've been very, very active with them, and my time on it. Like if you take were to add up all the hours. It's ridiculous how much time I've spent with them, and there were periods of time where I started to actually think of myself as as living more in that world than in this one. And um, in the book, I even mentioned there's a there was a psychic healer who I took my girlfriend to um, for a healing, and he came walking out of the room, and I was just sitting there waiting for my friend, and as he walked by, he just nodded at me and said hello. And then he stopped and he backed up and he looked at me and he said, "Oh my my my, you have a lot going on, don't you?" <laughs> and he said, "Do you?" <laughs> he said, and and he said, "Do you know that you're barely here?" He said, "You barely have a toe in this reality." He said, "You're more there than uh-huh. you are here." And so I think that the um, the encounters during the day um, they just were easier. They would pop in and take you know pick me up. Um, I was as a child we lived in a very isolated area and um it was easy for me to disappear for one two or three hours without my mother noticing that because we were kept outside all day long and um and they came a lot for me 
um, a lot when I was a child. And on into my teen years, they, they came um, a lot of the times when I was at my friend Vicky's house. And um, they started shifting to nighttime, encounter, you know, all nighttime and daytime. But some of the encounters were at night at her house. I would get up and go, leave the bed um, and walk out the door. And the ship was always over on the rise. So just a, it was a lot of activity. I've spent a lot of time with them. I, I believe it's because um, they really took good care of me. They really did. They, they, my body was very well um, watched over by them, and uh, they also wanted to keep my connection to them intact because it was not easy for me to be here. I was very homesick right from the get-go. I remember arguing that I didn't want to go back into that little bitty body um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, soon after I was born. It's a memory that I had. I didn't put it in the book. Um, I didn't put everything in the book. It, there was, I just didn't. But um, yeah, I have a memory of, of, and I never quite could make sense of it. I kept thinking, trying to make it that I was looking at my sister when she came along. She was born when I was five. And I kept wanting to think it was her that I was imagining this about. But I remember standing by the crib with Da, um, who is the... Um, the um, the ET that I have always had my encounters with. He's always been there, and I remember standing there and not arguing, but just saying, "I don't, I, I don't think I signed that. I didn't understand this was what it was going to be like. I don't want to go back into that body. It's not, it's not easy. It's, it's very, very dense. And I remember, I didn't argue. I just, but I know I had to be coached, coached, and I had to be reminded." that this is what, you know, you agreed to do this. Now, you know, you're you're doing it. And uh-huh. so um, I think that um, I think that they spent a lot of time with me in order to keep me in the higher vibration so that I wouldn't feel so out of place here, so that I wouldn't, um, uh, wouldn't get so homesick that I might decide. You know, I've always been kind of a melancholy, not really sad or depressed, but just homesick my whole life. Yeah, you don't know how many hundreds of people I've heard this same story from. Oh, really? Well, and I know we must have many, many listeners out there. That oh, are yeah. Like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but they're always emailing us, and they say, you're telling my story. Have you read my books, The Three Waves of Volunteers? I read one of them, Dolores, when I first awakened to the fact that I was a volunteer, and I uh-huh. ran out and, and got it, and I just, I just ate it right up, yes. Because uh, you, you're I, describing... You're quoting, you're quoting stuff. Out yeah, you're books. describing... Oh, really? There. Well, yeah, you know, because um, they definitely don't want to be here, and they don't mm-hmm. like it here, and it is okay. very dense and heavy, yes. Yes. and uh, they get in here. But in there, see, a lot of the volunteers are ETs, right? and so whenever they are coming, they're taking care of their own people, making right. sure they're safe here. Right, right. And that's what I feel that I am. I mean, I, this is, I've always said that this is, I always used to say, this is my, this is my one and only time here. You know, I haven't been human yeah. before, I would say. And that's, that's who I knew myself to be. Um, but the reason I don't read a lot of books, I, I just wanted to just get that in there. I don't read other people's stories or listen to other things because I don't want it to taint my memories and my, what I say. So um, I ha- I, it's unusual for me to read, but I did read your book. But I don't read. I've heard Travis speak, but I haven't read his book. I just don't. I just don't do that stuff because I don't want to have that stuff uh, color my own experiences. Well, that's so. the way me. I don't read other people's work yeah. because later they'll come out and say, "Well, you stole my material because yeah. they're so much alike." Yeah. So that's why I don't uh, read other people's books except for research. Right. But. Right. Oh, yeah, I read the manuscripts that are submitted, but I think that's That's other people's work. Well, it is, yeah, but (laughs) okay. All right. But, um, well, do you have, uh, what kind of memories do you have? Like when you're taken, uh, when when they, you have the encounters, do you, do you always go back to the ship or? Yeah. You know what happens? Mm Mm-hmm. It's always um, to the ship. Um, There was an encounter that I had. I write about it in the book. Um, I almost didn't put it in there because it's so personal, but it was a recent one in, um, I think it was in the winter of 2010 uh, that I asked, 2010 or 2011, it's been just a short while ago, that I asked to be taken to see my hybrid children. 
And um, I don't know what uh, triggered me to ask. Well, I'm estranged. You know, I have a rough relationship with my own children, two daughters. And um, there was something in me that just yearned for that kind of connection. And so I asked if I could um, have some time with my hybrid children. And uh, they took me on that on that instance, they took me to some place. I don't know where. Um, it was a beautiful site that was very green and lush, very much like um, the earth. But my sense was that it was not the earth, but it was it was just beautiful. And um, it looked like it had a house on it that looked a lot like an earth house, but it was kind of a big kind of a mansion type thing. And um, um, that was one of the times that they took me somewhere that was out different than the ship. And then once they took me when I was a child, they took me below the um, over the Pacific Ocean and down around the Catalina Islands and down deep into the ocean and back into some cavern and way deep into the earth under the ocean. And I don't know what that was. That was some kind of a base. And that was just a beautiful, oh, that was a beautiful, beautiful place. I did not want to leave there. I had dreams hmm. about that for right. the lo- longest time. Just a They say place. there are bases underneath. Yeah, the, what, what the did road. it look like? Um, I don't remember a lot of it. I, I remember I remember that I loved it there. I remember uh, we went through a series. I don't know. We got, I don't know. I mean, because there's picture, there's windows, you know, and I was always allowed to watch out the windows sometimes. And we went down through the water uh, way deep. It was dark and black. And then we went into this, like, I guess I would call it like a, cavern or something and we went through some some kind of like locks or something but anyway we came to an area where there you know there was no water in there and um and we got when I came out of the ship there was a the colors in that place were so beautiful that they actually they seemed like they were alive I don't know how else to describe it the colors it was a vibration more and it had like a almost a sound to it the colors were alive and there was a blue that was there that I have never forgotten and I yearned to see that blue color again it's just beautiful and there was a wide sweeping staircase and I remember that I was invited and told that I could walk I go up that staircase and so I I remember that part of it but I that's and then that's all the memory I have um mm. but oh, it's wow. just spectacular but Otherwise, the time is on the ships, and I've been on the mother ships as, you know, the huge, huge, huge ships, and then I've been on the little scout ships and then everything in between. And I have, I have memories of being on the ship a lot of time, a lot of time spent with children, and that's that's one thing I didn't put in the book. I've had children, I had several children um, know me, and they know me, um, and they tell their parents, they know me, that I read to them on the ship at night. They know you here. They know me here. They write. It's the weirdest thing. They know me. I'll, I'll give one example because it'll be easier. Because I had a, I have like five different stories of this, but the one that was the most intriguing was um, uh, someone that I worked with. Uh, had a business uh, relationship with him, him, and he had um, an autistic child. Um, and this boy, I had never met him, but I had heard um, my friend talk about him, my business associate talk about him, and. Um, one day, um, this guy told me, he said, my son um, heard my wife give me the message. You know, you called the house for me, and, and my wife said, Sherry Wilde called for you. And he said, my son said, Sherry Wilde? Sherry Wilde called? And I, his son used, I think, a typewriter to communicate with. And he got all excited, and he typed out this message, and he said, my son said that he knows you. And he recognized mm-hmm. your name. Yeah, they, and he recognized my name, which I thought, you know, I can't explain that because I don't know how that works, that he would recognize my name if I'm on the ship. But anyway, he recognized my name. And then and and um, my friend said, you you don't know her. You've never met her. And he, and he kept insisting he knew me. So then um, my friend said, well, describe what she looks like. And so he typed out what I looked like. And he said, well, okay, how do you know her? And then he said, she reads to me at night and he said how and he said when i go on the ship and he said he'd been <laughs> talk- he he and he said he'd been talking about that he's been going on some ship he said at night he goes on a ship and he said we didn't know what he's talking about and uh-huh. and this guy said you know what he's talking about and i said well yeah yeah i do <laughs> and um, yeah yeah it makes so sense to us yeah. huh it makes sense to us yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But you know, yeah. Uh, there was one uh, one man told me uh, when he was a little boy, he knew every night he would go somewhere where he went to school. Yes. Yes. Be me teachers too. there. Yes. And he said there were other kids in the neighborhood that he knew also went. Right. And they would go when they were sleeping, and they'd all be on board. Right. Wherever they were, they were in a classroom. Right. But he said the next day he'd go up to these kids, and they didn't know what he was talking about. Right. So right. he remembered, but they didn't. I did, too, as a child. I remembered being in the schools. Um, I, I remember it all. I remember the, the teachers, what they looked like, what they were wearing. I remember all of that. Yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's and my yeah, it, it's a common thread that goes through mm. my family actually. So yeah, we do go to school, and we're multidimensional, you know. So there's an aspect of us that's doing that. Um, you know, it gets really involved to try to explain it because it isn't always necessarily. Although my encounters were all physical up until recently, when um, it started to be more astral or on a on a more non-physical basis but um as a child and, and up until just a few years ago my encounters were all physical you know I, I was i was leaving with you know in the body totally and it was a physical experience so mm-hmm. um, now it appears that that's not always the case and it's a little bit different um it's bizarre uh, that's the only way to put it it's bizarre and you know i I have someone that um, that's a witness to it. My partner is witness to a lot of the things that happen at my house at night. And, you know, I mean, he's seen the ships. He's seen the guys in the room. He's heard me talking to them. He's seen me get out of bed. You know, I've been seen, you know, I've been observed getting up, walking out the door and disappearing. Um, but they don't take him too? Um, he asked if he could meet them. And um, I had already asked. Da, if if uh, he could have an encounter, and Da said, "Not now. He's not ready." But then six weeks, I think it was six weeks later, or so many weeks later, he actually did get his encounter. They picked him up for about twenty minutes to half an hour, and it was. Uh-huh. Got How did he do? He did great. He has no fear. He has Wonderful. No fear. Yeah, it's on my because. blog. It's on my blog if you want to read about it. It's really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> because you know, in many of the cases I've written about, they'd be uh, sleeping together in a bed. Mm-hmm. And the one person is taken, like the woman, and she said her husband's laying right there, and she's trying to wake him up. Yeah. So don't you see them? Don't you see what's happening? And yeah. they can't wake him up. They sleep through everything. Right. That's the way it was <laughs> back in the early years. Yeah, my husband, he just, he'd be dead to the world, or he'd be pa- almost like passed out. He was in a stupor, you know. I mean, they put they put you in an altered state. And yeah. You, yeah, you just can't. You can't wake up. If, if they don't want you with, they take care of that business. Yeah, they do. it's yeah. a very personal thing is what mm-hmm. it is. Yes, yes. Well, can I go back on that? You were talking about when you asked to see your hybrid children. You just said you were taken to this other place, this mansion. So did you get to meet your children? I did. I met, um, there were about, let me see if I can remember how many, there were about, was it about a dozen to 18 of them? I can't remember how many were there. Um, they were, um, uh, it was very emotional, and um, I, I've been told that I have, I think it's 42 oh my um, goodness. hybrid children, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that I, on some level I know them all, but um, this, was a, on a, this was on a more conscious level that I was able to have this um, time with them. And it was very emotional, very emotional. They're beautiful, beautiful. They're, I was <laughs> surprised at how old they were, some of them. Um, but then I realized, you know, they've been taking... Um, uh, my OVA since I was, um, you know, 17 years old for sure. And so, That's what I was going to say if you knew yeah. how it happened because you're mm-hmm. right. They do take the, the eggs mm-hmm. and they take the sperms and mm-hmm. different ones. And uh, these are all being created for a reason and it's right. a positive reason. Right. And so many people think that's supposed to be bad and negative with the hybrids. But it's this is part of what the so-called abductions was about. Right. Right. It, it was part of um, my program that I signed on for when I came here. I remember agreeing. Um, my program was um, a two-part program, and it was um, to assist with Gaia um, for the, during the ascension process, which we're in now. But um, the early part of my job was to, um, to, to be a participant in the hybrid program. And yeah. so I have yeah, these 42 beings. And, you know, anyone who thinks that that's a bad thing, you meet these 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 
people, and they are just amazing, just amazing, light-filled, beautiful, loving creatures. Just there can't be anything evil about that. They're just wonderful, amazing. So, no. What do they look like? Um, You know, they all were um, very normal, for the most part, human-looking, except for there was one gal there who had more of the um, ET DNA in her. Um, But but she was just a beautiful, light-filled being, but she definitely had more of the ET um, DNA. And I'm not sure what that was about. The rest were all... They could walk down the street, and the only thing you'd notice about them is that they just have a... If, you're in, if you can read vibration or if it can sense the light reading in another being, you would notice that they all were of a high vibration. So, okay, because I've heard that some of them uh, do look different. Uh-huh. Like, there is a mixture there. Right, right. Like, well, but see, I can... Like, I, I, I meet people now. I've done... Several times I've met, um, and I'll give another, I've got several examples of that. I'll give one example, which I thought was kind of interesting. It was, I was in Costa Rica and met with some people down there um, just looking at, um, I was thinking I had had an urge to to leave um, USA for a while. And I went down there and I was looking at a a place to live and considering it. And um, had lunch with a group of the people who were already living down there, and there was a young man sitting at the far end of the table, too far away for, for me to talk to, but I I looked at him, and, and after the lunch was over, um, I got up and started to walk back toward my car, and he came over, and he said, I, um, he said, Cherry, I want to just say hello to you, and I turned, and I, and I looked at him, and I recognized him, and I recognized him energetically, you know, and... Um, I shook his hand, and he shook my hand, and he said, oh, right. He said, there it is. And, we, you know, and I knew what he was talking about. You could feel the energy. And he looked at me, and he said, so I know you, right? And I said, yes, you do. And I said, and I know you. And he said, we need to talk. And he said, you know where I know you from, right? And I said, I said yeah, I know <laughs> yeah. where I know you from. You know, um, so <laughs> it's, um, I, re- I meet these kids. I call them kids. There's a lot of them who are in their mid to late 30s and early 40s and they're Pleiadians, you know, and I can read their energy um, stamp and, um, you know, and I, I I can recognize them very easily. And so um, I don't know if you call, I don't guess you'd call them hybrids, but there's, they certainly have brought some of that DNA with them because I, I see it in their eyes when I look at them. But it's Jerry, an, we it's call a them the <laughs> You call them what? The second wave. Okay. Okay. Because in the book, the three waves of volunteers. Those are those yeah, are the ones. And they do. They have this energy that you you just know. Oh. Um, okay. Okay. Good to know. Because I see them all over the place, and I just love them because they're such oh, they're loving tons, beings. Thousands oh. of them. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. we we travel all over the world, and we're running into these everywhere. Wonderful. And they have that energy that really it's here to save the earth. Yes. That's yes. how powerful the energy is. But and I was getting the feeling when you were talking about the hybrid children, I was going to ask you, do you think some of them are here? Because that's it was coming through as a very real feeling, like they, they have their foot in the door here, just like, you know, like you're in, we have these multiple dimensions and everything. I, um, I feel like they're here, and I'm wondering if you know that. My sense is that those um, children, those or the adults now, that they are not, that... Um, that the world is, um, that this earth is not um, of a, a good fit for them. Their vibration is actually a little bit higher than that. And uh-huh. so they may come onto the planet, my, I believe they may come onto the planet after we finish um, moving into the fifth dimension totally and, our, and after we've gone through the what we need to go through to get there. Um, maybe that's the purpose of it. That's kind of a sense of knowing that I have. Right now, they're just busy living their own lives um, on their own world, wherever that might be. Maybe it's on the ship. Some of them, I think some of them are, are on the ship, but I think most of these beings were living on whatever planet this was that I was taken to. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal. That's what I've written about. A lot of them are being, mm-hmm. they're, prepared they're prepared for prepared. another planet. Right. Yeah. Well, Oh, sense. really? That's so interesting. See, I love it when th- when I get validation. That's always yeah. good. Yeah. Now, I mean, every way I so I said is why I wanted to publish the book because everything in it goes along totally with what I found. Yeah, it's taken me a while to learn to trust the information that I got 
or that huh. I have, the remembering that I'm going through, it, it started happening um, you know, around 2009, I guess, is when I started to really, when the recession hit and I didn't have a business to run anymore, it opened up all this time for me, and all of a sudden I became, I started to remember all this about my, and start to have more activity again, something mm-hmm. that really shocked me. As a matter of fact, I write, I do write that in the book when, when Da showed up, you know, in in my bedroom one night, and I mean, I really was pretty calm, and I said, what are you doing back here? You know, I'm I'm past menopause, you know, you shouldn't be messing with me anymore. And he just, he was like insulted. He's like, what? You don't remember about the earth changes? We told you about that. That's what all your training was about. There's work to be done. And I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were done. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, that's what they keep saying. Oh, no, you're just starting. I know it. I know it. That's what they're, he's like, there's work to be done. And I was like, what? Yeah, so it's been really interesting. It's been very interesting. Well, let's I'm, hear what you have to say on that because we're always talking about the changes and the shifts and everything. So it'd be really good to hear that. That's probably what this caller is going to ask. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, you know, we give lectures everywhere, and that's the main thing we lecture on is mm-hmm. what's going to happen. You want to yeah. take the caller first? Yeah, let's take the caller and see if that's maybe part of what they're asking. Okay, and then mm-hmm. we'll get on to that. Okay, caller, uh, who's there? Uh, my name's Alice. I'm calling from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi. How are you this evening? Hi. How's everybody doing today? Okay. Very good. What What's your question? Okay. I have. A, I have. My question is this. Um. I'm doing some research, and I'm trying to um, get as much research as I possibly can because I'm really interested in anybody that was born in the call. Do you know what that is? The board of the what? In the call. Oh, the me, call, me, oh, C-A-U-L. I know. Oh, you mean with the, uh, what they call the veil. On the face, yes. you mean when they're born? Yes. Yes. As an old wife's tale, I was you know. I just wondering the, if. With the, yeah, that's what they used to call the old wife's tale. If they're born with part of the. Uh, the membrane is over their face. They said they're born with the veil, and they're supposed to be very psychic. Uh, but that's old wife's tale. But um, who knows if it's real or not? Is that what you mean? Yes. Well, that would just go back to people that are psychic, really. Right. I don't know how many of them even know if they were. They're born in hospitals. Nobody's going to say, you know. Mhm. Well, you 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 have to um, you have to tell the hospital that you want to know. Because you know when you're having a baby, they're too busy; they don't even pay attention. Well, they well if there's a family you know. history of it, if sometimes it runs in families. Um, mm. Yeah. It's like one in one thousand, one in one eight thousand births that it happens to. Yeah. I was just doing some I've investigational stuff on that. I'm asking a lot of people about it. Not too many people know about it. Um, I read back uh, far in the history of it, and it goes all the way back to where maybe in Caesar's time where if you were born in that manner, such as a call, you were, they automatically considered considered you to be a ruler, a king. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very uh, old. Uh, uh, um, well, they call it a wives' tale. We live here in the country in Arkansas, and those are the kind of things that they pass down mm-hmm. through hit their uh, belief systems. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it'd be hard to find somebody. They'd have to know. Well, but I think you're just referring really to people who are psychic. I don't think it matters okay. if they're born with a veil or not. You know. Well, anyway. Okay. Now I have another question for you. But I respect um, research because I love it, and to whatever whatever uh, sparks your interest, pursue it. You know. Okay, go ahead. Well, I am. I, I've, I've been really pursuing it lately, only because my mother was born of a call, and she told me that I was born of a call. Okay. And um, when I was a very very young girl, I had an awful lot of um. Out of body experiences and psychic experiences, and and I, I I could look at nature, and I felt like nature could speak to me and tell me things. Okay. 
And, yeah, uh, I mean, I that doesn't shock me, but I hear this all the time. Well, what's your other question? Yeah. My other question is, with these extraterrestrial beings out there, um, th- is it possible that they can come to Earth and um, kind of like being like a hidden thing and appear to you as nature? Oh, yes. As a they are very good or... at that, of appearing as something that you don't know what it is. They love to appear as animals. You know? Okay. Jerry, you've you heard of that, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I've experienced it, yeah. yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, yeah, my mother and, and uh, my partner and, um, yeah, and myself. I mean, you think you're seeing an owl or a deer or yeah. a dog. I mean, all kinds of things, yes, definitely. And all you remember are, you know, the, eye, the difference is always the eyes are so striking. But, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because I've written about mm-hmm. that in many of my books. It, I call it an overlay because it's mm-hmm. done so that the person won't be afraid. Right. They appear to the person as an animal, right. and uh, well, the animal is mm-hmm. not acting uh, like an animal should act, you know, afraid or anything. But right. there's many people have seen that, and then if, whenever I do my work with the hypnosis, we find out it was a uh, overlay, and it was actually just to appear to them so they won't be afraid. So this is very common, yes. <laughs> well, we're only yeah. going to have I'll, a few I'll more share minutes a little experience here. With you. Mm-hmm. What? I I was um, in in, in New Jersey sitting on the beach one summer, not too long ago, just a couple years ago. And this is just one of my experiences that I have. And it's not anything I control, it just happens. And all of a sudden, 25 butterflies just came out of nowhere and just landed all over my body. (laughs) And I, I had this overwhelming feeling that they were there to have a conversation with me. Oh, yeah. And I got scared. I got scared, and I looked over at my shoulder because I had taken my hand, and I was trying to brush them off my legs and my chest and my arms, and and they would fly off and come back, fly off and come back, and one stayed there. It didn't move, and I didn't want to hurt them because I knew if I touched the butterfly, I would remove the powder, and it couldn't fly, and I didn't Uh want to do that, and then something inside of me said, they're here for a reason. Pay attention. Don't run from them. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the one butterfly, which was sitting on my my left arm, close to my shoulder, and I looked at it, and the sucker looked at me. We were eyeball, eyeball. And it said to me, we are here. We are here to take. We are here to take them. We want you to know we're here. Mm-hmm. And I, I And I got fearful, so I jumped up and I ran in the water. Oh, well, that made back, him leave. Said, <laughs> okay. Well, we're running out of time, but yeah, my mother no, this, to this to me is very yeah. natural because I know it's real. You, did, They're trying to right. make you aware. You have to open up your psychic abilities to be able to communicate. Sounds like he's doing it. So yeah. Cool. Well, I did open up my psychic abilities. The thing was, I knew they were there telling me they were going to take something, and I didn't want to give it, and I looked at my mother. And I thought it was her. And I got this big lump in my throat. And she said to me, oh, my God, Alice, I've never seen anything like that. And I said, Mom, this is not good. This is not good. And they came back. And I went back into the water, and I wouldn't come out of the water until they just flew right on down the beach. And (laughs) I went home that that night, and when I got up the next morning, my son was dead. It wasn't my mother. Son, it was my son. I knew that that darn butterfly looked at me straight in the face and said, "We are here." I thought she submitted her phone. And I thought they were telling me they were here to take my mother because she was elderly. Uh huh. And the next morning when I got up, it was my son. He was gone. He died like six o'clock in the morning. I think they but were just trying to give you. Uh, to let a message that something was going to happen because they didn't take him. Right. No, they right. just trying to give. Well, you that's a what they said. Back. That that's what I thought. But anyway, like two years later, my mother passed. Okay. Okay. And I was riding down the street, and all of a sudden, there was like this big rainbow in the sky, and the clouds opened. It was a rainy day, and the sun broke through, and it was really pretty. And I looked up at the sky, and then I heard say to me. 
And it wasn't like a voice from outside. It was a voice from within me. And it said, we were here for both of them that day, but we decided to leave your mother to help you through with your son. Okay. And well, I that thought, makes oh, sense. my God. Okay, but, uh, well, I want to, to thank you for calling because we're going to have to go off the air here. But thank you for calling. Oh. But everything you say makes perfect sense. Okay, and thank you. And, Sherry, we're going to have to sign off. And uh, we'll be seeing you. <laughs> we're all a... being left in suspense about what she knows. <laughs> I know. I know. We were, we were just going to get on my favorite subject. The, the I, know, I know. I know. Well, no, we could gonna... continue next week. We don't have anyone scheduled for next week. Yeah, we... I'd, I'd, I could. I would. I would. I think I can do that. I th- oh, wait a minute. Um, I'd have to check. <laughs> I, I have to check first. I'm doing um, a, um something on the Ozark Mountain thing. Was that? No, that's the thirty first. 31st, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, because uh, we, we are we leaving. Say, come, come to the conference and see what you have to say. <laughs> okay, because we're going to have to hang, hang we're going to sign off or he's going to pull the plug. He does yep. that. We'll pull well, the plug. Let's see if we can continue this. Then. Okay, then maybe we can. But uh, anyway, thanks, Sherry, for coming on tonight. It's been very interesting. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. It went fast. <laughs> It so, did. A whole hour yeah. went fast. It went very fast, but thank you. Thanks I to our it. callers for calling in. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I want to thank everybody for listening tonight. So, good night, everybody. Make it great. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.